just last week. I told you that we might require an armed guard before we left. I didn't know the details of it. I didn't know what happened last week. That was in the future then. We have items that people want, items that they have killed people for. It's a personal risk going out there. There's no question about it. You know, if something happens or if people feel that whatever their obligations are, whatever their personal feelings are, that they've reached that point and want to go back. I don't blame anybody for that circumstance. I will help you leave, you know, in a timely fashion. In spite of the danger, no one wants to turn back. The caravan heads north, deeper into the desert, further from civilization, toward a bone-rich place they call Baco. That's where Paul found sauropod bones on his first trip to Niger, seven years ago. From now on, though, everything they do, from driving to digging, will be done under armed guard. Is this a good direction here? Uh, 20 degrees left. Is this tight? Yeah. 20 degrees left? Yeah. Okay, so we've come back. Using the coordinates from Paul's previous visit and a satellite navigation system called GPS, they are able to find a prehistoric needle in a desert haystack. So we're 10 kilometers away? Right. Almost seven years after Paul first found this site, he has finally returned. Okay, show me the money. Where's the bones? Bones are right here. You, you had a dream that started at that spot seven years ago, and you now have the chance to, to see what really is there. Some of the bones are right at the surface, but will there be more below? It's amazing. Are they connected to the rest of a 60-foot-long, 25-ton dinosaur? There's a lot of stuff here. Before they find out, they'll need a place to stay. Get chin stuff? Yeah, I get it. Yeah! She came as a um, special envoy from the state of Wyoming. Damn it! How are they? 108. That's on the wrong side. Holy shit! Man! We're good. The bones are pinned underneath tons of rock, which will have to be removed by hand. For the next two weeks, they will pick and hack at the rock for 14 hours a day, in heat that often pushes over 120 degrees. For the younger students on the team, the term field trip has taken on a whole new meaning. If you come walking out of here in two and a half months and you say, that is not the hardest thing that I have done in my life mentally and physically, then you haven't tried hard enough. That kind of sentiment is what ultimately opens the, the thickest, the, the hardest doors to, to actually get through, the most impossible doors to get through. The hard work pays off. They have removed more than five tons of rock and found a surprise. There are not one, but two skeletons. It's a multi-body death scene. Well, we have um, a couple of skeletons mixed at the site. That's a conclusion we've drawn after a lot of work. What, we, what, what we've discovered when we first started peeling back the mound here is the hip region and backbone of a very large sauropod. Here's the vertebrae here. It appears that the animals were the victims of a huge flood. Extremely powerful currents piled their multi-ton bodies in a stack and the river sediment buried their bones. While they now have the two skeletons, neither one has a skull. That's because skull bones are delicate and often weather away. But it's a big disappointment for paleontologist Jeff Wilson. Yeah, you can see I mean, that's what the animal is seeing with, that's what it's bringing in food with, that's what it's, you know, it's meeting the world with that skull, and uh, there's a lot of information in it.
a lot of times you can follow the neck and as it gets closer and closer and closer to the head, you know, like over here we have a complete neck almost all the way up to the last vertebra that's before the head and then no head. And then no head is a common refrain among paleontologists. Of the roughly 70 species of sauropods that have been found, only about 12 have heads. But there's still the chance that underneath the pile, they'll find the prize they're looking for. And that's why I'm hoping that maybe parts of the skull got snagged underneath, and we're, we're not going to know until a little bit later. A little bit later is a recurring mantra for someone working on a dig like this. A little bit later, I won't have heat stroke. A little bit later, my back won't hurt so much. A little bit later, I get to sleep. But Paul doesn't seem too concerned about sleep. With our solar lanterns, we can work at night. <laughs> that kind of nearly obsessive drive is, perhaps, one key to Paul's success. Gabe, it continues. The tail continues, or there's another bone here. When he finally stops digging, Paul and some of the crew are going to relax by trying to put together the jigsaw puzzle from Mesozoic Hell. Yeah, I don't really understand what's going on there. It doesn't look like there's a good fit. Since the prospects for finding a complete skull fade with each day, they're trying to build their own with skull fragments they've already found. Wow! That is One of the most fascinating of these pieces is a tooth. And two teeth in the lower jaw come in just like that and they create these wear facets um, <laughs> along the edge. And it, it's literally like, uh, you know, an, inter, an interdigitating uh, scissors. And it they believe the animal was essentially a giant tree trimmer whose diet consisted of plants. Now all they need is a jaw and skull to put the tooth into. You want to try and put it together? They've got about 10% of the skull reconstructed. You, you can actually see the brain cavity. Is right, right at my fingertips here. Remarkably, the, part of the, the part of the brain required to operate this titanic creature was about the size of a walnut. Doesn't require that much. But what the animal lacked in brain size was more than made up for by its spectacular set of bones. This 50,000 pound creature was basically a walking bridge. Massive vertical columns supported the span of vertebrae, and these in turn, with their various attached ribs and processes, held up the sumo-like guts. Fascinating as this creature is, the painful truth is that getting it out of the ground is a whole lot like root canal, and can get a little tedious, even for the veterans. It's all the same work, and we do it every single day. It's nice to have uh, things to sort of break up the monotony. The, uh, the temperature right now is it's the coolest it's ever been since we've been here. It's probably about 110, 112. Sometimes he just has to be with his sheep. Perhaps the only thing more monotonous than digging for dinosaur bones in the desert would be guarding people digging for dinosaur bones in the desert. La queue qui va tout là derrière. Là, c'est la jambe de derrière. Il y a le fémur. After a couple of weeks of watching the team work, some of the guards come over to take a closer look at the ancient death scene. They, they know it. It's the big animal. I mean, they often refer to it now as the big animal uh, because um, they see big bones and, and uh, you know, it, it could be, it could have been that there were many species here, but the, it seems like this animal is very dominant. And so they, when we talk about the big dinosaur, you know, they know what we're talking about. Huh? Yeah, yeah, what did they eat? What did they eat? Yeah, they See, if they made goats this big, you'd only have to get one goat for the whole season. <laughs> okay. 
They've finally reached the point where it's time to prepare the bones of this big goat for the trip back to the lab. Oh, that's beautiful. It's a process called jacketing, and it's designed to protect the bones from damage. First, the bone is covered by foil or paper towel. This makes a separation layer between bone and plaster. Then the whole thing is covered with plaster-soaked burlap strips. You start off with like skim milk, and then, <laughs> then you go like a 1%, 2% whole milk, and then you get like 40% cream, which is what John reads right now. <laughs> it's a lot of fun until you got to pull it off your arm hairs. We should all shave before we do this. We forced to shave. Watch this. Ugh. Ow! Once they're jacketed on the top, it's time to flip them and plaster the other side. One, two, three. Two. But the word flip implies something light, like a coin. These coins can weigh more than 2,400 pounds. Perfect. One, two, three. <laughs> After five weeks at the FACO site, they have removed more than 40 tons of rock, excavated roughly 15 tons of fossils, and found nearly every bone of this new animal, except the skull. Leaving Africa without the most important part of the animal would be a major disappointment. So, as they head out to a new location for three days of prospecting, they know this is their last chance. On their way to the new location, they stop at a small village. In the Sahara, where there's a village, there must be water. Okay. We're stopping at... Um a little village that is um, not far from our site, but it gets rough as we go towards our site. So we're gonna leave our drinking water here. Yeah. Strategically, it's also close to well water for camels. And we'll use that well water for camels for our plaster. This is a town called Merendet. It's a town that uh, is not far from the fossil localities, a little village, a uh, camel stop. It's got a lot of wells <laughs> and the people are very friendly here. And so we're gonna give them a, a little gift for watching over our water. You only have so many chances to uh, travel around the world and see stuff like this. And uh, it, it really is part of the fun of, of doing an expedition like this. Frankly, it is a great break <laughs> from the routine. <laughs> a well in the Sahara is a magnet for life, attracting everything from people to camels to goats. <laughs> It's the crew's best glimpse of daily life for the desert people known as the Tuareg. Hungry, <laughs> green? Good luck. For good luck. Like good watering holes the world over, it's a great place to catch up on gossip and other useful bits of information. Uh, he says he found two more skeletons. If you're interested in going to look. I don't know if we have time. What, what's the distance? How far? Oh, that's Maybe. a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> How about in time? It's never far. You can see from the number of animals and the number of people here that they uh, walk all over the desert. And so if there's an obvious skeleton somewhere, probably somebody's seen it many times. And so um, uh, this man seems to have, uh, uh, wants to lead us to something that he believes uh, we might be interested in. This isn't the first time Paul has relied on the Tuareg and their keen knowledge of the desert to find bones. It's a mutually beneficial relationship, in spite of some curious communication problems. The, the one thing that um, you do need to uh, take account of is that they will direct a car typically like they would direct a camel. 
and this can be quite a challenge uh, when you're going to find a location because 